Chapter 6, The Beauty of Literature. Part 1. That in the practice and pleasure of art for art's sake there lurks an unworthy element, is a superstition that recurs in every generation of critics. A most accomplished and modern disciple of the gay science but yesterday made it a reproach to the greatest living English novelist, that he, too, was all for beauty, all for art, and had no great informing purpose. Art for art's sake is clearly, to this critic's mind, compatible with a lack of something all desirable for novels. Yet if there is indeed a characteristic excellence of the novel, if there is something the lack of which in a novel is rightly deplored, then the real art for art's sake is bound to include this characteristic excellence. If an informing purpose is needed, no true artist can dispense with it. Otherwise art for art's sake is a contradiction in terms. The critic I have quoted merely voices the lingering Puritan distrust of beauty as an end in itself, and so repudiates the conception of beauty as containing all the excellences of a work of art. He thinks of beauty as cut up into small snips and shreds of momentary sensations, as the sweet sound of melodious words and cadences, or as something abstract, pattern-like, imposed from without, a Procrustes bed of symmetry and proportion, or as a view of life Circe-like, insidious, a golden languor, made of the selfish serenities of Wildwood and Dream Palace. All these, apart or together, are thought of as the beauty, at which the artist for art's sake aims, and to that is opposed the nobler informing purpose. But the truer view of beauty makes it simply the epitome of all which a work of art ought to be, and thus the only end and aim of every work of art. The beauty of literature receives into itself all the precepts of literature, there is no ought beyond it. And art for art's sake is but art conscious of its aim, the production of that all-embracing beauty. What, then, is the beauty of literature? How may we know its characteristic excellences? It is strange how, in all serious discussion, to the confounding of some current ideas of criticism, we are thrown back, inevitably, on this concept of excellence. The most ardent of impressionists wakes up sooner or later to the idea that he has been talking values all his life. The excellences of literature. They must lie within the general formula for beauty, yet they must be conditioned by the possibilities of the special medium of literature. The general formula, abstract and metaphysical as it must be, may not be applied directly, for abstract thought will fit only that art which can convey it, hence the struggle of theorists with painting, music, and architecture, and the failure of Hegel, for instance, to show how beauty as the expression of the idea resides in these arts. But if the general formula is always translated relatively to the sense medium through which beauty must reach the human being, it may be preserved, while yet affirming all the special demands of the particular art. Beauty is a constant function of the varying medium. The end of beauty is always the same, the perfect moment of unity and self-completeness, of repose in excitement. But this end is attained by different means furnished by different media, through vision and its accompanying activities, through hearing and its accompanying activities, and for literature, through hearing in the special sense of communication by word. It is the nature of this medium that we must further discover. Part 2. Now the word is nothing in itself, it is not sound primarily, but thought. The word is but a sign, a negligible quantity in human intercourse, a counter in which the coins are ideas and emotions, merely legal tender, of no value save in exchange. What we really experience in the sound of a sentence, in the sight of a printed page, is a complex sequence of visual and other images, ideas, emotions, feelings, logical relations, swept along in the stream of consciousness, differing, indeed, in certain ways from daily experience, but yet primarily of the web of life itself. The words in their nuances, march, tempo, melody add certain elements to this flood, hasten, retard, undulate, or calm it, but it is the thought, the understood experience, that is the stuff of literature. Words are first of all meanings, and meanings are to be understood and lived through. We can hardly even speak of the meaning of a word, but rather of what it is, directly, in the mental state that is called up by it. Every definition of a word is but a feeble and distant approximation of the unique flash of experience belonging to that word. It is not the sound sensation nor the visual image evoked by the word which counts, but the whole of the mental experience, 
to which the word is but an occasion and a cue. Therefore, since literature is the art of words, it is the stream of thought itself that we must consider as the material of literature. In short, literature is the dialect of life, as Stevenson said, it is by literature that the business of life is carried on. Someone, however, may hear demur, visual signs, too, are the dialect of life. We understand by what we see, and we live by what we understand. The curve of a line, the crescendo of a note, serve also for wordless messages. Why are not, then, painting and music the vehicles of experience, and to be judged first as evocation of life, and only afterward as sight and hearing? This conceded, we are thrown back on that view of art as the fixed quantity of imaginative thought supplemented by certain technical qualities, of color in painting, of sound in music, of rhythmical words in poetry, from which it has been the one aim of the preceding arguments of this book to free us. The holders of this view, however, ignore the history and significance of language. Our sight and hearing are given to us prior to our understanding or use of them. In a way, we submit to them, they are always with us. We dwell in them through passive states, through seasons of indifference, moreover when we see to understand, we do not see, and when we hear to understand we do not hear. Only shreds of sensation, caught up in our flight from one action to another, serve as signals for the meanings which concern us. In proportion as action is prompt and effective, does the cue as such tend to disappear, until, in all matters of skill, piano playing, fencing, billiard playing, the sight or sound which serves as cue drops almost together out of consciousness. So far as it is vehicle of information, it is no longer sight or sound as such, interest has devoured it. But language came into being to supplement the lacks of sight and sound. It was created by ourselves, to embody all active outreaching mental experience, and it comes into particular existence to meet an insistent emergency, a literally crying need. In short, it is constituted by meanings, its essence is communication. Sight and sound have a relatively independent existence, and may hence claim a realm of art that is largely independent of meanings. Not so the art of words, which can be but the art of meanings, of human experience alone. And yet again, were the evocation of life the means and material of all art, that art in which the level of imaginative thought was low, the range of human experience narrow, would take a low place in the scale. What, then, of music and architecture? Inferior arts, they could not challenge comparison with the poignant, profound, all-embracing art of literature. But this is patently not the fact. There is no hierarchy of the arts. We may not rank Street Paul's cathedral below Paradise Lost. Yet is the material of all experience is the material of all art, they must not only be compared, but paradise lost must be admitted incomparably the greater. No, we may not admit that all the arts alike deal with the material of expression. The excellence of music and architecture, whatever it may be, cannot depend on this material. Yet by hypothesis it must be through the use of its material that the end of beauty is reached by every art. A picture has lines and masses and colors, wherewith to play with the faculty of vision, to weave a spell for the whole man. Beauty is the power to enchant him through the eye and all that waits upon it, into a moment of perfection. Literature has all thoughts, all passions, all delights the treasury of life, to play with, to weave a spell for the whole man. Beauty in literature is the power to enchant him, through the mind and heart, across the dialect of life, into a moment of perfection. Part 3. The art of letters, then, is the art whose material is life itself. Such, indeed, is the implication of the approval theories of style. Words, phrases, sentences, chapters, are excellent in so far as they are identical with thought in all its shades of feeling. Economy of attention, Spencer's familiar phrase for the philosophy of style, his explanation of even the most ornate and extravagant forms, is but another name for this desired lucidity of the medium. Pater, himself, an artist in the overlaying of phrases, has the same teaching. All the laws of good writing aim at a similar unity or identity of the mind in all the processes by which the word is associated to its import. The term is right, and has its essential beauty, when it becomes, in a manner, what it signifies, as with the names of simple sensations. 
less than one greater than he quotes therewith de Maupassant on Flaubert, among all the expressions in the world, all forms and turns of expression, there is but one, one form, one mode, to express what I want to say. And adds, the one word for the one thing, the one thought, amid the multitude of words, terms, that might just do, the problem of style was there. The unique word, phrase, sentence, paragraph, essay, or song, absolutely proper to the single mental presentation or vision within. Less than one greater than appreciations, an essay on style. Thought in words is the matter of literature, and words exist but for thought, and get their excellence as thought, yet, as Flaubert says, the idea only exists by virtue of the form. The form, or the word, is the idea, that is, it carries along with it the fringe of suggestion which crystallizes the floating possibility in the stream of thought. A glance at the history of language shows how this must have been so. Words in their first formation were doubtless constituted by their imitative power. As Taine has said, less than one greater than at the first they arose in contact with the objects, they imitated them by the grimaces of mouth and nose which accompanied their sound, by the roughness, smoothness, length, or shortness of this sound, by the rattle or whistle of the throat, by the inflation or contraction of the chest. Less than one greater than H. Taine, La Fontaine et ses Fables, p. 288. This primitive imitative power of the word survives in the so-called onomatopoetic words, which aim simply at reproducing the sounds of nature. A second order of imitation arises through the associations of sensations. The different sensations, auditory, visual, olfactory, tactile, motor, and organic have common qualities, which they share with other more complex experiences, a form, as force or feebleness, a feeling, as harshness, sweetness, and so on. It is, indeed, another case of the form qualities to which we recurred so often in the chapter on music. Clear and smooth vowels will give the impression of volatility and delicacy, open, broad ones of elevation or extension, airy, flea, large, far. The consonants which are hard to pronounce will give the impression of effort, of shock, of violence, of difficulty, of heaviness, the round squat turret, black as the fool's heart, those which are easy of pronunciation express ease, smoothness, fluidity, calm, lightness, facile, suave, roulade, lucent syrups, tinct with cinnamon, a line like honey on the tongue, of which physical organ, indeed, one becomes, with the word tinct, definitely conscious. In fact, the main point to notice in the enumeration of the expressive qualities of sounds, is that it is the movement in utterance which characterizes them. That movement tends to reproduce itself in the hearer, and carries with it its feeling tone of ease or difficulty, explosiveness or sweetness long drawn out. It is thus by a kind of sympathetic induction rather than by external imitation that these words of the second type become expressive. Finally, the two moments may be combined, as in such a word as roaring, which is directly imitative of a sound, and by the muscular activity it calls into play suggests the extended energy of the action itself. The stage in which the word becomes a mere colorless, algebraic sign of object or process never occurs, practically, for in any case it has accumulated in its history and vicissitudes a fringe of suggestiveness, as a ship accumulates barnacles. Words carry with them all the meanings they have worn, says Walter Rawley in his essay on style. A slight technical implication, a faint tinge of archaism in the common turn of speech that you employ, and in a moment you have shaken off the mob that scours the rutted highway, and are addressing a select audience of ticket holders with closed doors. Manifold may be the implications and suggestions of even a single letter. Thus a charming anonymous essay on the word grey. Grey is a quiet colour for daylight things, but there is a touch of difference, of romance, even, about things that are grey. Grey is a colour for fur, and Quaker gowns, and breasts of doves, and a grey day, and a gentlewoman's hair, and horses must be grey. Now grey is for eyes, the eyes of a witch, with green lights in them and much wickedness. Grey eyes would be as tender and yielding and true as blue ones, a coquette must have eyes of grey. Words do not have meanings, they are meanings through their power of direct suggestion and induction. They may become what they signify. Nor is this power confined to words alone, 
on its possession by the phrase, sentence, or verse rests the whole theory of style. The short, sharp staccato, the bellowing turbulent, the swimming melodious circling sentence are truly what they mean, in their form as in the objective sense of their words. The sound values of rhythm and pace have been in other chapters fully dwelt upon, the expressive power of breaks and variations is worth noting also. Of the irresistible significance of rhythm, even against content, we have an example amusingly commented on by Mr. G. K. Chesterton in his Twelve Types. He, Byron, may arraign existence on the most deadly charges, he may condemn it with the most desolating verdict, but he cannot alter the fact that on some walk in a spring morning when all the limbs are swinging and all the blood alive in the body, the lips may be caught repeating. Oh, there's not a joy the world can give like that it takes. Away. When the glow of early youth declines in beauty's dull. Decay. That automatic recitation is the answer to the whole pessimism of Byron. Part 4. Such, then, are some of the means by which language becomes identical with thought, and most truly the dialect of life. The genius will have ways, to which these briefly outlined ones will seem crude and obvious, but they will be nonetheless of the same nature. Shall we then conclude that the beauty of literature is here? That, in the words of Pater, from the essay I have quoted, in that perfect justice, of the unique word, omnipresent in good work, in function at every point, from single epithets to the rhythm of a whole book, lay the specific, indispensable, very intellectual beauty of literature, the possibility of which constitutes it a fine art. In its last analysis, such a conception of literature amounts to the unimpeded intercourse of mind with mind. Literature would be a language which dispenses with gesture, facial expression, tone of voice, which is, in its halts, accelerations and retardations, emphases and concessions, the apotheosis of conversation. But this clearness, in the sublime sense, including the ornate and the subtle, this luminous lucidity, is it not quite indeterminate? Clearness is said of a medium. What is it that shines through? Were this clearness the beauty we are seeking, whatever in the world that wanted to get itself said, would, if it were perfectly said, become a final achievement of literature. All that the plain man looks for, we must think rightly, in poetry and prose, might be absent, and yet we should have to acknowledge its excellence. Let us then consider this quality by which the words become what they signify as the specific beauty rather of style than of literature, the mere refining of the gold from which the work of art has yet to be made. Language is the dialect of life, and the most perfect language can be no more than the most perfect truth of intercourse. It must then be through the treatment of life, or the sense of life itself, that we are somehow to attain the perfect moment of beauty. The sense of life. In what meaning are these words to be taken? Not the completest sense of all, because the essence of life is in personal responsibility to a situation, and this is exactly what in our experience of literature disappears. First of all, then, before asking how the moment of beauty is to be attained, we must see how it is psychologically possible to have a sense of life that is yet purged of the will to live. All experience of life is a complication of ideas, emotions, and attitudes or impulses to action in varying proportions. The sentiment of reality is constituted by our tendency to interfere, to take a hand. Sometimes the stage of our consciousness is so fully occupied by the images of others that our own reaction is less vivid. Finally, all conditions and possibilities of reaction may be so minimized that the only attitude possible is our acceptance or rejection of a world in which such things can be. What does it matter to me whether or not the old, unhappy, far-off things really happened? The worlds of the Borgias, of Don Juan, and of the Russian war stand on the same level of reality. Okasan and Nicolette are as near to me as Abelard and Heloise. For in relation to these persons my impulse is nil. I submit to them, I cannot change or help them, and because I have no impulse to interfere, they are not vividly real to me. And, in general, in so far as I am led to contemplate or to dwell on anything in idea, in so far does my personal attitude tend to parallel this impersonal one toward real persons temporally or geographically out of reach. Now in literature all conditions tend to the enormous preponderance of the ideal element in experience. My mind in reading is completely filled with ideas of the appearance, 
ways, manners, and situation of the people concerned. I leave them a clear field. My emotions are enlisted only as the inevitable fringe of association belonging to vivid ideas, the ideas of their emotions. So far as all the possibilities of understanding are fulfilled for me, so far as I am in possession of all the conditions, so far do I realize the characters, but realize them as ideas tinged with feeling. Here there will be asseverations to the contrary. What? Feel no real emotion over little Nell, or Colonel Newcomb? No emotion in that great scene of passion and despair, the parting of Richard Feverell and Lucy, a scene which none can read save with tight throat and burning eyes. Even so. It is not real emotion. You have the vivid ideas, so vivid that a fringe of emotional association accompanies them, as you might shudder remembering a bad dream. But the real emotion arises only from the real impulse, the real responsibility. The sense of life that literature gives might be described as life in its aspect as idea. That this fact is the cause of the peace and painlessness of literature, since it is by his actions, as Aristotle says, that man is happy or the reverse, need not concern us here. For the beauty of literature, and our joy in it, lie not primarily in its lack of power to hurt us. The point is that literature gives none the less truly a sense of life because it happens to be one extreme aspect of life. The literary way is only one of the ways in which life can be met. To give the sense of life perfectly, to create the illusion of life, is this, then, the beauty of literature? But we are seeking for the perfect moment of stimulation and repose. Why should the perfect illusion of life give this, any more than life itself does? So the vision of a picture might be intensely clear, and yet the picture itself unbeautiful. Such a complete sense of life, such clear vision, would show the artist's mastery of technique, but not his power to create beauty. In the art of literature, as in the art of painting, the normal function is but the first condition, the state of perfection is the end at which to aim. It is just this distinction that we can properly make between the characteristic or typical in the sense of differentiated, and the great or excellent in literature. In the theory of some writers, perfect fidelity to the type is the only originality. To paint the Russian peasant or the French bourgeois as he is, to catch the exact shade of exquisite soullessness in oriental loves, to reproduce the berserk rage or the dull horror of battle, is indeed to give the perfect sense of life. But the perfect, or the complete, sense of life is not the moment of perfect life. Yet to this assertion two answers might be made. The authors of Bellamy, or Madame Crisontem, or The Triumph of Death, might claim to be saved by their form. The march of events, the rounding climax, the crystal clear unity of the finished work, they might say, gives the indispensable union, for the perfect moment of stimulation and repose. No syllable in the slow unfolding of exquisite cadences but is supremely placed from the first page to the last. As note calls to note, so thought calls to thought, and feeling to feeling, and the last word is an answer to the first of the inevitable procession. A writer's Donny, they would say, is his own. The reader may only bed, make me something fine after your own fashion. And they would have to be acknowledged partly in the right. In that inevitable unity of form there is indeed a necessary element of the perfect moment, but it is not a perfect unity. For the matter of their art should be, in the last analysis, life itself, and the unity of life itself, the one basic unity of all, they have missed. It is a hollow sphere they present, and nothing solid. Henry James has spent the whole of a remarkable essay on D'Annunzio's creations in determining the meaning of the fact that their total beauty somehow extraordinarily fails to march with their beauty of parts, and that something is all the while at work undermining that bulwark against ugliness which it is their obvious theory of their own office to throw up. The secret is, he avers, that the themes, the anecdotes, could find their extension and consummation only in the rest of life. Shut out, as they are, from the rest of life, shut out from all fruition and assimilation, and so from all hope of dignity, they lose absolutely their power to sway us. It might be simpler to say that these works lack the first beauty which literature as the dialect of life can have, they lack the repose of centrality, they have no identity with the meaning of life as a whole. It could not be said of them, as Badgett said of Shakespeare, he puts things together, he refers things to a principle, rather, 
they group themselves in his intelligence insensibly around a principle, a cool oneness, a poised personality, pervades him. But in these men there is no cool oneness, no reasonable soul, and so they miss the central unity of life, which can give unity to literature. Even the apparent structural unity fails when looked at closely, the actions of the characters are seen to be mechanical, their meaning is not inevitable. The second answer to our assertion that the sense of life is not the beauty of literature might call attention to the fact that sense of life may be taken as understanding of life. A complete sense of life must include the conditions of life, and the conditions of life involve this very energetic identity on which we have insisted. And this contention we must admit. So long as the sense of life is taken as the illusion of life, our words hold good. But if to that is added understanding of life, the door is open to the profoundest excellences of literature. Henry James has glimpsed this truth in saying that no good novel will ever proceed from a superficial mind. Stevenson has gone further. But the truth is when books are conceived under a great stress, with a soul of ninefold power, nine time heated and electrified by effort, the conditions of our being seized with such an ample grasp, that even should the main design be trivial or base, some truth and beauty cannot fail to be expressed. Part 5. The Conditions of Our Being. If we accept, affirm, profoundly rest in what is presented to us, we have the first condition of that repose which is the essence of the aesthetic experience. And from this highest demand can be viewed the hierarchy of the lesser perfections which go to make up the perfect moment of literature. Instead of reaching this point by successive eliminations, we might indeed have reached it in one stride. The perfect moment across the dialect of life, the moment of perfect life, must be in truth that in which we touch the confines of our being, look upon our world, all in all, as revealed in some great moment, and see that it is good, that we grasp it, possess it, that it is akin to us, that it is identical with our deepest wills. The work that grasps the conditions of our being gives ourselves back to us completed. In the conditions of our being in a less profound sense may be found the further means to the perfect moment. Thus the progress of events, the development of feelings, must be in harmony with our natural processes. The development, the rise, complication, expectation, gratification, the suspense, climax, and drop of the great novel, correspond to the natural functioning of our mental processes. It is an experience that we seek, multiplied, perfected, expanded, the life moment of a man greater than we. This, too, is the ultimate meaning of the demands of style. Lucidity, indeed, there must be, identity with the thought, but besides the value of the thought in its approximation to the conditions of our being, we seek the vividness of that thought, the perfect moment of apprehension, as well as of experience. It is the beauty of style to be lucid, but the beauty of lucidity is to reinforce the springs of thought. Even to the minor elements of style, the tone coloring, the rhythm, the melody, the essence of beauty, that is, of the perfect moment, is given by the perfecting of the experience. The beauty of liquids is their ease and happiness of utterance. The beauty of rhythm is its aiding and compelling power, on utterance and thought. There is a sensuous pleasure in a great style, we love to mouth it, for it is made to mouth. As Flaubert says somewhat brutally, Je ne said qu'une phrase est bon corpus lavoir fait par sa par mon gueule. In the end it might be said that literature gives us the moment of perfection, and is thus possessed of beauty, when it reveals ourselves to ourselves in a better world of experience, in the conditions of our moral being, in the conditions of our utterance and our breathing, all these, concentric circles, in which the center of repose is given by the underlying identity of ourselves with this world, because it goes to the roots of experience, and seeks to give the conditions of our being as they really are, literature may be truly called a criticism of life. Yet the end of literature is not the criticism of life, rather the appreciation of life, the full savour of life in its entirety. The final definition of literature is the art of experience. Part 6. But then literature would give only the perfect moments of existence, would ignore the tragedies, ironies, pettiness of life. Such an interpretation is a quite mistaken one. As the great painting uses the vivid reproduction of an ugly face, a squalid hovel, to create a beautiful picture, 
beautiful because all the conditions of seeing are made to contribute to our being made whole in seeing, so great literature can attain through any given set of facts to the deeper harmony of life, can touch the one poised, unconquerable soul, and can reinforce the moment of self-completeness by every parallel device of stimulation and concentration. And because it is most often in the tragedies that the conditions of our being are laid bare, and the strings which reverberate to the emotions most easily played upon, it is likely that the greatest books of all will be the tragedies themselves. The art of experience needs contrasts no less than does the visual or auditory art. This beauty of literature, because it is a hierarchy of beauties more and less essential, exists in all varieties and in all shades. If the old comparison and contrast of idealism and realism is referred to here, it is because that ancient controversy seems not even yet entirely outworn. If realism means close observation of facts and neglect of ideas, and idealism, neglect of prosaic facts and devotion to ideas, then we must admit that realism and idealism are the names of two defective types. Strictly speaking, whatever goes deep enough to the truth of things, gets nearer reality, is realism, yet to get nearer reality is to attain true ideas, and that is idealism too. The great work of literature is realistic because it does not lose sight of the ideal. Our popular use of idealistic refers, indeed, to the world seen through rose-colored glasses, but for that possible variety of literary effort it is better to use the word romance. Romance is the world of our youthful dreams of things, not as they do happen, but as, without any special deeper meaning, we should wish them to happen. That is the world of the gold-haired maiden, the lover with the red roan steed of steeds, the purse of Fortunatus, the treasure trove, the villain confronted with his guilt. Never the time and the place and the loved one all together. But in romance they come together. The total depravity of inanimate things has become the stars in their courses fighting for us. Stevenson calls it the poetry of circumstance, for the dreams of youth are properly healthy and material. The salvage from the wreck in Robinson Crusoe, he tells us, satisfies the mind like things to eat. Romance gives us the perfect moment of the material and human, with the divine left out. It has sometimes been made a reproach to critics, more often, I fear, by those who hold, like myself, that beauty and excellence in art are identical, that they discourse too little of form in literature, and too much of content. But all our taking thought will have been vain, if it is not now patent that the first beauty of literature is, and must be, its identity with the central flame of life, the primal conditions of our being. Thus it is that the critic is justified in asking first of all, how does this man look on life? Has he revealed a new, or better, the eternal old meaning? The Weltanschauung is the critic's first consideration, and after that he may properly take up that secondary grasp of the conditions of our being in mental processes, revealed in the structure, march of incidents, suspense, and climaxes, and the beauty or idiosyncrasy of style. It is then literally false that it does not matter what a man says, but only how he says it. What he says is all that matters, for it will not be great thought without some greatness in the saying. Art for art's sake in literature is then art for life's sake, and the informing purpose, in so far as that means the vision of our deepest selves, is its first condition. And because the beauty of literature is constituted by its quality as life itself, we may defer detailed consideration of the species and varieties of literature. Prose and poetry, drama and novel, have each their own special excellences springing from the respective situations they had, and have, to meet. Yet these but add elements to the one great power they all must have as literature, the power to give the perfect experience of life in its fullness and vividness, and in its identity with the central meanings of existence, unity and self-completeness together, in a form which offers to our mental functions the perfect moment of stimulation and repose.